Hello and welcome to the latest Blood Red podcast from the Liverpool Echo. I'm your host Matt Addison with Ian Doyle, Paul Ghost and Tom Cavella all with me as we look back on Leicester just like Thiago Alcantara did when he spanned past James Madison and ahead to Burnley just as Jurgen Klopp did this morning in his pre-match press conference. Plenty of other things on the agenda as well Doyle. I'll come to you first. Liverpool 2-0 winners on Thursday night. They did exactly what they needed to do. Brendan Rodgers asked his players for a reaction, but I don't know about you, but to me, it just never really felt like Liverpool wouldn't win that. It was, was fairly comfortable considering, of course, that it was Leicester, their opponents, a, a decent team who have at times, very recently, of course, just a few weeks ago, caused Liverpool a fair few problems. Yeah, it was an interesting one, wasn't it? I think uh, Leicester's team selection did kind of play into Liverpool's hands a little bit. It was interesting, Brendan Rodgers said after the game that they didn't have many centre-back options as such. That's been a problem for them and you can't get consistency when you haven't got any fit centre-backs. I mean, who knew? <laughs> who knew that? Like, <laughs> come on. Let's, uh, wow, this is a massive revelation this season. Anyway, um, so he picked uh, a Martin and Didi, didn't he? Thinking that they could get through the game as they did at the, the game at uh, the King Power Stadium back in December. Didn't quite happen. But Liverpool, to be fair, at the start they played, you know, I you know Ghosty agreed with me on this one, is that First 10 minutes, they're pretty good. Then they had about 15 minutes where they were not very good at all. They kind of lost the rhythm. But in the minute Jota scores, that's kind of that set the tone for the rest of the game. And can't really think of possibly what was it, Madison's shot in the first half very early on that Allison tipped around, which probably wasn't even going in anyway. As Leicester's only real chance. I mean, in the second half, they looked slightly brighter after after half time, uh, Leicester. Liverpool wouldn't say that they slack, slackened off a little bit, but they, they did lose the ball one or two times in midfield. I think Firmino did once, I seem to recall. But other than that, yeah, Liverpool, if it wasn't for Schmeichel, Liverpool would have won about four or five nil. I don't think anybody could have complained, complained too much. Going forward in the second half, they seemed to, you know, seem to click together a little bit more, a bit more energy to the game. And, uh, you know, Jurgen Klopp was very happy with that second half performance, and rightly so, because that's more the kind of game Liverpool should be playing and need to play, because... I know um, the results have been good. I mean, what is it now? Two defeats in about 43, 44 games. I mean, it's something, some ridiculously long run like that. It's 11 but, months, isn't it? Going yeah. back to the form one in March. Yeah, so the game batters, but it's a lot. It's, well, it's probably yeah. it's about 40 odd, isn't it? Yeah. But the the thing for me is that at Palace, they played very well first half. I mean, we know well after 35 minutes, they just seem to stop playing. But there's been a, quite a few games where they've done well in patches, but I'm really convinced. I think the second half against Leicester, against. Look, I know Leicester are way down the league and, and you know, Rogers made the point after the game. He, he got asked about this. He said, you're nearer the relegation zone than the, the top four. And he said, well, hang on, we've got about 15,000 games in hand here. So, you know, we have to bear that in mind. But Leicester are a decent team. They've made life difficult for Liverpool in the not-too-distant past. Liverpool made fairly light work of them. And, yeah, it didn't ever look like they were going to lose the game. But, you know, as long as it's 1-0, there's always a chance the oppo- you know, the op- opposition can just could just something out of nothing. And Leicester certainly have got players who can do that. So that's why there was that big relief when Jota put in the second. And I'm sure we'll get on to him a little bit later on because he's uh, quite an intriguing soul, isn't he? He certainly is. I think we'll we'll come on to him straight away, actually. Diogo Jota, of course. He's 17 now for the season, on track to score 20-plus in the Premier League. I mean, it's every type of goal as well, isn't it? We saw the kind of, of poachers finish. We've seen the headers and, and spoken about them. There's just, there's a real sort of rounded element to his game that I think we, we probably didn't see coming when he first signed. We we knew he was was capable of it in little sort of bits and pieces, but to be this consistent, I think is, is really impressive. Yeah, no uh, no question about that. I think when he, when he first came to the club, a lot of us were talking about his ability to play in a few positions, which is one of the reasons why Liverpool were keen to bring him to the club. But you're looking at it now when he's been at the club for 18 months or so, maybe a little bit less. He's, he's a number nine, isn't he? He's a centre forward, he's a striker, he's a died in the wall centre forward. Now there's no no two ways about it. He started on the right hand side yesterday and looked a bit awkward for well, up until the moment he, he hammered that in from inside the six yard box, which is ironically where all the best strikers do their work. So, um, you see him sometimes on the left, he looks a little bit more at ease on the left, but I just think now he's he is just an out and out number nine in, in the same way that you'd consider Roberto Firmino to be one. So, um, it's it's those two now who are co- competing for that position in the same way that and Luis Diaz and Sadio Mane are competing for that position on the left. You know that Mohamed Salah hasn't really got any equal in Liverpool squad or, or the world at the moment, so 
for me, um, I mean, you can get away with playing Jota on the right or the left if needs must, but um, I think he's proven now while he's been at the field that he is a, just an out and out, you know, old school striker. Um, and there's not too many of those about anymore, is there really? In world football, you've got like Sir Harry Kane, Lewandowski, you know, the very elite ones that few and far between that tends, tends to be the wide forwards. Now we've become the, the stars in the teams, but. As you say, he's up to 17 goals now, um, 12 in the Premier League. He's hot on Mo Salah's heels for uh, Premier League's top goal scorer. And I think that's going to be a little fascinating duel between those two between now and the end of the season to see who does come out on top. Um, still fully expect Salah to because he's in the driving seat and now he's back fit and fire and he could have had an attack last night. So, um, yeah, Liverpool are, are well placed in um, several areas. But for now, I just think um, if Jota plays, he has to be down the middle. We're going to come on to, to talk about the, the squad and the depth and, and the options, Tom, that, that Liverpool have got. But I know there's there's not really such a, a thing as a first eleven, is there? But if there was such a thing, Diogo Jota now undoubtedly has got to be in that for Liverpool. Yeah, I think um, <clears throat> Jota, yeah, like you said, he's going to be one of the, the first names on the team sheet now just because of how well he's been performing for Liverpool since he's arrived at the club. Um, I think it's more... You know, the point everyone's sort of debating is more the midfield area. That's, you know, that's where it's more up for debate, I think, with, um, you know, whether he goes for Harvey Elliott, Curtis Jones, uh, Oxley Chamberlain. There's just a few more options in midfield for him to sort of think about. But, yeah, I think Jota and Salah are obviously going to be the first two he's going to start with, you know, in an ideal scenario. And then it's going to be between, you know, Diaz, Firmino just to sort of battle out for the other places in attack and obviously Mane as well. So, yeah, I think it's quite impressive, you know, how well he has adapted to Liverpool because, you know, at Wolves he was a good player, but he wasn't showing this kind of form on a consistent basis. So, yeah, I think he's earned the right really to be considered like a starter every week now for Jurgen Klopp. What, what I would say about Jota is, <clears throat> obviously, as, as everybody knows, I do the player ratings for Liverpool. And thanks for all the feedback, everybody. Love it. Um, anyway. Be your the, uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I did a piece um, during the recent midwinter break where I had a look at you know the averages of everybody was performing, this, that, and the other. And the lowest player by miles was Jota. Now, I think part of the reason for this is because... Yeah, he gets moved around. He, he gets the early hours rating him, yeah. Uh, <laughs> he gets moved around. Well, that's the exact reason why it was. But he gets... I'm trying to now explain it, Paul. Uh, he gets moved around quite a lot, as, as we've mentioned. And yeah, I agree. He's got to play down the middle. He's okay down the left, actually. Don't mind him playing on the left. But on the right, no, not for me. And I don't think he really wants to be there anyway. You saw that. The game on uh, on Thursday, even before he got moved into the middle, went for Mino, went off. He was just veering into that central area. That's where he got the goal. I know it was from a corner, but that's where he got the goal. But he won that free kick, didn't he, in the first half, where he just said, I've had enough of this, and just ran straight down the middle and then and got fouled. But with Jota, he, he is that kind of player that he can have these games where he just disappears. And that reminds you a little bit of Firmino when he first when he first joined for those first couple of years. And I think if he's going to end up playing down the middle, which he will do eventually, I think, is he possibly just has to change his game ever so slightly. Not in terms of... Because he, he, he's more of a goal-getter than Firmino, but Firmino's more of a player who links the play, which Jota can do. But Jota's more of a direct runner. So whether or not it's Liverpool would have to change their play slightly because the midfield misses out a little bit with you know, Firmino likes to drop back. I know Jota does that, tries to do that, but he's not quite got the same you know, element to his game that Firmino's got in terms of nicking possession of plays. He's not quite as good as that, although you know, he can do it. And I think whether or not Liverpool have to balance that a little bit. But if he's scoring 17 goals a season, you know, it just shows you that, like a lot of strikers, they tend not to be you know, old school strikers. They can be not be in the game for absolutely ages. And then they just end up, you look at the end of the game and, oh, look, they've scored twice. Which, again, is a little bit like, say, for me, and I was when he first joined Liverpool. You see games where you go, he doesn't seem to have done much. Then you look at your notes and you go, hang on, he got two assists and put another chance for somebody else. And it's maybe... There's a greater because he's got the goals, Jota. That's where the appreciation is. But I think overall for his overall game, I don't think possibly, certainly not by me anyway, he's not being appreciated uh, quite as much as perhaps he should do. Or it's a sign that maybe he's not quite like with Firmino, like with lots of other players. He, he's still quite adapting to, or Liverpool are adapting to him to try and get the best out of him, which is exactly why he's, he's not 
playing in a position all the time where he, where he should be because Liverpool don't have that many options. Yeah, I think it's it's 30 goals in 60 appearances, I think, for, for Liverpool so far. Not many players. I think there's only nine or, or something like that that have, have sort of been at that level um, in Liverpool's history. So clearly has, has made a, a pretty in, instant impact, Gorsty. In terms of instant impacts as well, Luis Diaz came in for his Premier League debut. No goal for him yet, but again, a, a real real good sign, really, of, of what could be to come for him. Yeah, he had a really good game, didn't he? I think Klopp said after the game that it's the best debut that he'd ever seen, I think, something along those lines. Um, he could have had a couple of goals, couldn't he? He was really unlucky with the save that Schmeichel made. Um, Schmeichel had a, had a great game on the night, to be fair. I think you pointed out, Doyle, didn't you, after the game they'd made, was it nine saves? Um, just yeah, nine, nine, nine saves, yeah. Yeah, um, probably the best one was the one when Diaz almost squirmed it through his legs and he managed to just get a kind of heel on it and keep it away from goal. Um, but yeah, he, he looked really, really lively. You know, when he got put in, must have been, could have only been 10 or 15 seconds on the clock and just sat up for him to hit it on his left and, and he decided to cut back. Just wondered if he'd, if he'd have taken that on his on his weaker foot. What a moment that could have been, you know, scoring inside. Well, I imagine it'd be a piece of history, wouldn't it? You know, the earliest debut and goal. But yeah, he, he, he was great. He worked the socks off. He didn't stop. He was popping up in all areas of the pitch. He was getting on the ball, showing plenty of quality, loads of really dangerous looking cutbacks into the into the uh, area uh, and looks like he's going to be a real strong addition to to, to the the options the club's got i mean i think you're looking at it before diaz arrives and you're thinking four goes into three with the big decision normally being jota or firmino and then if you have to Rigi and, and minimino can play a part here and there against some of the lesser lights shall we say but now with diaz you're looking at it and it's fire go into three and um, so it's a great chance to rest Mane maybe a little bit more than you know, um, you know, throughout the season when he's perhaps been running to the ground a little bit. You know, we've certainly seen that last season than when he was having a really tough time, but the build didn't have the option to take him off the team and, and give anyone else a go. And you wouldn't you'd be hesitant to rest Salah, you know, on a long term basis, certainly. But um, the fact that the options are there now is is great for Liverpool. Um I still expect Minamino and Origi to, to leave in the summer and kind of bring those options down again, numbers-wise, and we'll see what happens with Fabio Carvalho. But for the long term now, you know, Liverpool have got five really strong options for three places, and um, you wouldn't really grumble over who was filling, the, you know, any of those three spots in the next few months, would you? Um, but ideally, as I say, Jota down the middle and can't really take Salah off the team. Yeah, loads of, of options up front, Tom. Loads of options in midfield as well, as you mentioned before. Thiago and Fabinho, I thought, were, were both excellent last night. 14 league games, I think it is now. 13 wins and a draw. The last six that they've started together, Liverpool have only conceded one goal in as well. I mean, how crucial do you think those two are in terms of staying fit for the rest of this season, in terms of what Liverpool could achieve? <clears throat> yeah, I think it would be you know very important. I think with Thiago especially, we haven't really any sorts and glimpses of him in Liverpool shirt. So whenever he seems to sort of have a good run or put a good run together, he's then got injured again shortly after that. And it's it's been a bit stop start for him, his Liverpool career, which is a shame because obviously we've seen whenever he has played, he's you know he's done really well. So yeah, I think you know you've got quite a nice balance with those when you've got those two playing in the team. So I think you know if you're going to look at the three in midfield, those are the you know, those two players are the ones you want to have starting ideally each week if they can. And then I guess it's just a debate for the other, for that final third position, really, because he's got quite a few players to pick from for it as well. Um, but yeah, Thiago, really good last night. And then Fabinho, you know, he's been really consistent for Liverpool for, well, probably two years plus now. So uh, yeah, I don't think you could drop either of them really. Um Curtis Jones, I think he was a bit disappointing yesterday, to be honest. Um, you know, a bit sloppy on the ball and a bit slow, you know, in possession. But, you know, I think he maybe wouldn't be looking to start Curtis Jones, you know, on a regular basis. But, um, you know, he's got a lot of options in that, in that area. Curtis Tom, Jones Tom's is, is... filled the Theo role there. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> Curtis Jones. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I thought... I thought... 
I thought Curtis did all right in the first half an hour, and then he just did one or two passes, which were a bit iffy around his own area, and then he got subbed after an hour, which I suspect was probably going to happen anyway. So yeah. you know, I don't think he was awful, but you know, I think he's actually been quite good since he's come back into the team. Is that is that partly sort of the role that he plays as well? I know a lot of people get frustrated with him when he's trying to sort of keep hold of the ball a split second too long and, and things like that. But is is that not just the, the kind of role that, that Jurgen Klopp asks him to play? He wants him to play the right pass rather than just passing it to keep hold of it for the sake of it. That's the thing is that people have been saying for whenever Liverpool have not been playing particularly well in midfield, people have said, oh, how come there isn't just somebody can put the foot on the ball, which is what Thiago can do. Thiago does it by just like not moving around very much and letting the ball do the running. But Kurtz is a different player where he, he likes to run with it. It's very, he's actually very hard to get off the ball when he's lost the ball. He tends to have been passes, isn't he? I mean, I know he got dispossessed once, I think, in the first half against Leicester, but that's unusual. Tends not to be because he's, he's a big lad and he's strong, so he's able to do that. So, you know, you can't have it both ways. You know, he's a player who can, and I know, Matt, you want to see him on the left side of the front three along with the 15 other players. It's not, not going to happen anymore, <laughs> is it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think you, you, that one's gone. Um, midfield is his position. And I think he's he is basically, he's one of, you know, he's a, he's a homegrown player who's now one of an, uh, one of many options in a midfield that, I know, I know some Liverpool fans think it's the weak point of the team, but it's clearly not because it's arguably the most important part of the team under Jurgen Klopp. And you know, I've just I've just actually just been trying to have a look at something about Thiago. I'm pretty sure that the last time Liverpool Thiago started a game that Liverpool lost, if you just bear with me literally one second, I'll do this, was <laughs> back in March against Chelsea. And since then, I think they've won something like the last... They've won all 10 games this season that he started. And I think there was something like eight or nine towards the end of last season as well. So, you know, that's how important Thiago is. But yeah, don't 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 be going having a go at Curtis Jones. Come on, <laughs> come on. You're older than just, an, just an observation. <laughs> that was all. <laughs> <laughs> In terms of that midfield as well, Gorsty. I mean, there's obviously Curtis Jones helps with that kind of controlling element. Thiago as well as as Doyle says there. I mean, that's. That, that's the difference, isn't it? Where Liverpool maybe had an hour in previous games and then lost control and, and ended up drawing the game. When you've got those players in that midfield, they can just put their foot on the ball, they can keep it. And probably Thiago was, was really important in doing that on Thursday. Yeah, that's exactly why Thiago was signed, wasn't he? You know, you don't need to be this physical, incredible athlete to, to be a success, successful midfielder in the Premier League. I mean, it probably helps, but if you have the quality on the ball, then you can you can thrive and and uh, it's just so important that Liverpool kind of keep him fit now, isn't it? He's almost a like a um, he's got a bit of a, a Navi Keita narrative about him where you, you're so often lamenting that he's not able to stay fit because he's so you know he's so good. Um, you, you kind of lump those two in the same bracket just because they haven't been able to, to stay fit across the duration of the Liverpool careers, but if he is if he is able to now remain free of injury between now and the end of the season, Liverpool's chances of success are going to be massively increased because, um, I mean, I'm not sure how many he's played this season, but it can't, can't be too many because he got injured for five weeks or so, didn't he? It was in September and then obviously yesterday was his first start of 2022 and went into the middle of, uh, middle of February. Um, he, started, yeah, he, he, started, he started 10 games this season and they've, yeah, and they've, and they've won them all. Well, well, there you go. Yeah, I mean, as long as if you get him and Fabinho in the same midfield, and then you can kind of switch around that third man, whether it's Henderson or Harvey Elliott or you know Curtis Jones on occasion, I think Liverpool will be um, in a lot stronger position in terms of being able to go for everything. Um, I don't think they'll win everything. I mean, it's never been done before, has it? But certainly, you know, the one game away from winning the Carabao Cup, I fancy them against any team across two legs in the Champions League. And we'll see what happens with the FA Cup. You know, the quarter final is within reach with a game at home against Norwich. So um just just so many, you know, whenever you look at the moment for Liverpool, there's just so many different areas of, of positivity and things to be quite excited about, really. And, and Thiago coming back into the team is certainly one of them. Yeah, Mohamed Salah coming back as well. Tom is certainly another one of those. A really good reception for him when he came on at Anfield. I mean, we saw him when he came on. What what did you kind of, of make of, of his performance? I thought he looked pretty sharp. And I think the thing that we've all said at, at times over the last week or so is a wounded and angry Mohamed Salah is probably the best version of Mohamed Salah. Yeah, I thought well, I thought he did really well. Um, you know, he caused him quite a lot of problems in the sort of uh, edge of the box. 
uh, trying to do those runs we've seen him do quite often this season where he's you know weaving in and out inside the area trying to draw a foul um i thought that shot actually went in of his uh that hit the bar which was quite unlucky but um didn't go um, in tom it hit the no, bar I know. <laughs> um I, I thought it was going to be one of those you know back of the top corner again but um no he did play well and uh you know he's already looking like he's up to top form already even though he's just come back so you know i fully expect him to you know get back to scoring well in the coming games really I think, I think with Sal, I think he was just delighted to have one of his teammates within 40 yards of him. If anybody's seen any of the, 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 the AFCON, he didn't really get much service and he was often left just by himself. So he was absolutely, I mean, it was interesting. He came he came on with Harvey Elliott and the pair of them had a good relationship on the field, didn't he, earlier in the season. And uh, it just seemed to just kick on from there straight away. And, the, you know, he, he put in that good pass for Diaz, didn't he, for, for his chance. So no concerns over Salah. I just think, the well, the only concern is, making sure he doesn't get overburdened. He'll want to play all the games, but I think Liverpool probably did the right thing. And I wouldn't be surprised to see him rested for a, you know on the bench for a couple of games in the future as well. Yeah, they've certainly got the options to be able to to do that. We'll move on to, to Burnley then next. And obviously Sadio Mane as well. Doyle is one that will be on his way back, could potentially be involved in that one, but probably would expect him to, to start that one on the bench. Similarly kind of managed, I suppose, as, as Mohamed Salah has been. You'd think so, and I know we'll get into our teams in a bit, but with, with Manny, it's quite interesting because the Diaz thing is, we have to bear in mind, he shouldn't be at Liverpool. He shouldn't be here. He wasn't supposed to be here. That wasn't the plan. It's just like a little bit of a bonus. They were aiming to sign him in the summer, and once Tottenham came in, they thought, can't be doing with that. So they, they, they moved for him, and it will be interesting to see what happens with Manny in the summer, whether he decides it's time to move on to go somewhere else. You know, I don't know. He's like Firmino, like Salah in the last 18 months of his contract. But in terms of short term, yeah, I think Klopp said today, didn't he? He's probably still in bed, which is not a surprise, really. Bear, bear in mind some of the footage we've seen of the celebrations in Senegal. And rightly so. I mean, he's already now, he's, he was already was a, uh, a Senegalese legend. And now he literally has just written his name to the record books. You know, you can't take that away from him. And uh, he'll be, I mean, he'll probably want to play against uh, Burnley, like the same with Salah against uh, Leicester on Thursday. But can't see him playing. He's another one who's the minutes they'll have to be very careful with over the next few weeks. But at least, unlike all the way through January, Liverpool have now got the options to to take him out of the team if they need be. I think in, in terms of that, Gorsty, as well, with the, the options, the fact that he will have obviously had a big boost from winning AFCON, but will also come back with Luis Diaz fighting for that position. I mean, that, that can only be a good thing, can't it, for Liverpool? I mean, we've seen it with sort of Simicass earlier in the season pushing Andy Robertson. There's you know probably other examples that you can think of as well. But having that competition actually could make both of these players better. Yeah, of course. Um, you know, you're allowed to have more than eleven good players, aren't you? And, and I think for for too long, maybe maybe it's been a certain kind of thought process that thinks that you, Liverpool aren't. You know, as soon as you get two players competing for the same position, that it automatically means that one of them has to leave, or, or you know. He's going to be getting linked with the move away and, and whatever else. I mean, kind of seeing it a little bit further down the, the, the team now with Joe Gomez. He's not playing anywhere near as much as he'd hoped. And he's had, you know, he's coming back from injury and, and he's had COVID and whatever else. But there's this idea that because he's not playing every week, that, you know, sh- should he be looking to move on? And I, I just think Liverpool now have a, such a strong, settled squad that um, they absolutely should be looking to retain this core of players for as long as they've got and the more quality that you've got within that the more chance you've got of success in a number of competitions so having Diaz putting real heat on Mane now for the, for the starting position is, is superb and then um, you know in the next few years you're starting to see that kind of evolution and, and the, the next stage of what is to come at Liverpool and you imagine Diaz who only turned 25 this month will be Mane's long-term successor you know he's only got 18 months left on his contract we we'll see what happens with that. Um, but, you know, in, in the here and now, it's it's great that Liverpool have, have these options. And I think, think Klopp had the nail on the head today in his press conference when he said, well, there's a lot of talk at the moment about how strong the squad is, and, and rightfully so. Um, it's the strongest Liverpool squad I think I've ever seen, um, certainly in the Premier League area. But they've only signed Luis Diaz. Um, it's just the fact that for you know, the first time in a long while, 
through no injuries within the squad. You know, Mane's going to come back in. Henderson's been clear to play. So um, this is what Liverpool's squad is when, when everyone's fit. So it kind of makes a mockery of, you know, all the talk of, oh, Liverpool don't have the strength and depth and this and that, because at the moment, everyone's fit and they've only signed one extra player that they didn't have in August. So, um, yeah, it's just, as, as, as I said before, it's just there's just so many things to to look at at the moment and feel a little bit of positivity and optimism towards as we creep into the final third of the season. Yeah, Joe Gomez and Divock Origi both missed out, didn't they, on the, the match day squad for Thursday? Mm-hmm. Probably one or two more with Henderson and, and Mane to come back for, for Sunday as well, Tom. I mean, that just as much as anything else underlines the, the squad depth. But I thought the other interesting thing that Klopp said was that it, it's also the case that because they've only added one or two players over the last couple of years, that these players are well sort of versed in in how each other play. They they know inside out how Liverpool want to do things. And and that's a big advantage for them as well. Yeah, it's it's quite a settled squad really on the whole, isn't it? Um, you know, a lot a lot of clubs, you've got a lot of changes coming every sort of transfer window and moving players on and, you know, bringing new ones in. But, you know, at Liverpool, it's been done slightly differently in the sense that, you know, they try and keep, you know, keep the key players for as long as possible and, and then build around them over time. Um, it's obviously something that's worked well for the club because, you know, like you said, all the players have a good relationship on the pitch, a good understanding of, of what's expected of them. And um, yeah, I think it's something Liverpool will continue to do by the sounds of it. Well, I'm sure Klopp will look to carry that on as well. Um, and obviously that's only something that can benefit the team of everyone knowing their roles within the side. And, you know, over time you then get those sort of partnerships developing on the pitch, different areas of the pitch, you know, Salah and Trent on, on the right side or on that kind of thing. And I think that just comes, you know, over time from having those players playing so regularly together. Yeah, I thought there were some decent early signs from Robertson and, and Diaz on that left-hand side as well, which was was an interesting little partnership, obviously. Very, very early days for those two. But uh, in terms of Burnley, then we'll pick our teams for the game. Alisson will be in goal, Doyley, but uh, who are you going to go for at the back? Are you going to stick with the same back four or possibly change it up a little bit? Uh, I'm not sure. By the way, anybody watching on the on, on YouTube, um, this kind of bright things just started coming through the window, which we don't normally get in England in February, certainly not where I'm from. It's the sun, so it makes me look like I'm just being whited out of my face. Anyway, um, I... Ooh, interesting one, actually. I just, I'm not sure. I'm looking ahead to that Inter Milan game on Wednesday. You should know this. I'm going. Um, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I think... Um, who have they got next week? It's Norwich, isn't it? Playing, yeah. Do they have any Norwich, Norwich got a we, we yeah. this season? Honestly, um, yeah. so yeah, I do. Th- I do think you know they always say we we take one game at a time, but that's the biggest lie ever. They're always looking at games ahead. We've said this loads of times. So I do think it'll be Trent right back. I think Van Dijk plays. I would not be surprised if Simic has started, but I do think it'll be Robertson and the other centre back. I'm going to go with Canate. Yes, I'm going to do the same. I think it's it's an interesting one, isn't it? I'm going to go with with Canate. I'm probably going to leave Simicast to have Norwich at home, Gorsty. But what's your thinking? Yeah, I'd agree with that. Actually, I think Canate will start ahead of Matip. I think they're going to keep Matip in reserve for the um, Nerejuri on Wednesday night and Simicast for Norwich. So Robertson, Van Dijk, Canate, and uh, Trent. Tom, you in agreement with that or any changes? Um, yeah, I think I'd probably rest Matt it the uh, Inter Milan game, but I would probably start Robertson ahead of Simicass against Burnley. And then Trent and Van Dyke. Isn't that what we all said? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'd probably do exactly the same as everybody else is doing. Yeah. <laughs> Doyle, midfield? Uh, I'm still thinking about it. Go back to Tom. <laughs> Tom, go on then. Go, go through your midfield. I suppose um, the, the, the basis point is, what are you going to change? Presumably, Thiago and, and Fabinho will play, will they? Or, or possibly, is yeah. there, again, a change to, to make there with the Champions League in mind? Uh, well, if Henderson's fit, like Klopp seems to think he might be, I'd probably put him back in uh, into midfield. And probably Thiago and Fabinho again, yeah. Donny, have you decided? Yes, right. And I'm going to go with Fabinho. And I'm not going to go with Thiago. I'm going to go with Henderson. 
and I'm also going to play Cater because Cater, if memory serves me right here, he played a very good game against Burnley a couple of years ago at Burnley when they won 3-1, but he played like in the middle of a 4-4-2. I think, I think that's, the, that's the one where Gomez was right back and broke his leg that, that mm. game. So I do think that Cater, it's probably, you know, it's time to play. I know he, he, was, he was decent against Cardiff without being absolutely fantastic so in the first half, but I do think it's probably time for him to get a game and, he, and he'll, uh, I'd have him in there. Yeah, probably a few players that you could say it's it's time for for them to have a game. But uh, Gorst, are you going to go with with Cater as well, or what's the the sort of thinking for you? I'd like to just go Henderson, Fabinho, Thiago. I do still think that is Liverpool's best midfield. But we worry us over exerting Thiago. He hasn't played a whole lot, has he? Um, and I think into Milan is it's going to be a huge game. So. A bit reluctant to start Harvey Elliott as well because I think Burnley famously, you know, don't mess about, do they? And I think a young guy coming back from such a serious injury um, might be a recipe for disaster. So I, I, I'm a bit torn actually with the midfield. Um, maybe Oxley Chamberlain. Mm, um, I'll go with Firmino, Henderson, and Oxley Chamberlain. I, I wouldn't be surprised if Oxley Chamberlain starts instead of Kato. Just sort of say that. Yeah, it, it's certainly a possibility, isn't it? It's uh, it, it's it's a real conundrum, isn't it, with all of, of the options in midfield? And I suppose you could say the same as well, Tom, for, for the forward line. It's uh, again a number of different options. Probably Sadio Mane, you wouldn't expect to play, but the others. Any any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I was going to say I probably would have started Mane, but it doesn't sound like he probably sounds like he's not going to start. So. Uh, it might be one that he just comes on later on in the match, maybe later on. So, in that case, I guess I'd go for Firmino uh, in attack, um, Jota again, and then Diaz. Interesting. No Salah for Tom. Gorsty, no, I probably, I probably wouldn't play him for that. Ooh. No. Ooh. Big call, Gorsty? Um Yeah, I'd, I'd be playing Mo Salah. Um, I'd, I'd start Mane as well, actually. Um he hasn't played for he won't have played for a week, will he? He's had um plenty of rest away from the pitch, even if he's you know been passing her up in the car or, or whatever it was. Um Mane Salah and um what are you laughing at? It's, <laughs> wherever it was, wherever it was, yeah, yeah, I assume yeah. it was in the capital of Senegal. Um, <laughs> um yeah, and you just can't really leave Jota out, can you? As much as you might be thinking about that into Milan game. Just think, he's just right banging form. So, um, Jota, Mane, Salah. Yeah, I, I thought Luis Diaz would start one of Thursday or Sunday going in. Given he started on Thursday, that means I'm not going to play him Sunday. But what are your thoughts on that? I'm not playing him, and I'm also not playing Mane. So it's going to be Salah on the right, Firmino down the middle, and Jota on the left, which then leads to the game into Milan where Diaz won't start. But one of those front three will not be starting, and if it's not Firmino, it could become an interesting story. Yes, it certainly could, and we will come <laughs> to that interesting story on Monday's podcast. Um, I need to get that pointed because I'm not going to be here for the podcast on Monday, so I just wanted to say it now. <laughs> yes. Perfect. We will come back to it with whoever is in and available for us on Monday. But uh, just before we go today, we will go for our usual score predictions. I'm going to go for another 2 0 Liverpool win, I think. Doggy, how do you reckon it might be? I've also just remembered my brain and said I'm actually going to be here on Monday. So I got my days all wrong. Um, so <laughs> I'll repeat that on Monday. So you know what part of the podcast is going to be. Um, <laughs> Liverpool have actually got up. I know they lost the first game at Burnley, didn't they? It's one of Klopp's. Second game of Klopp's third, second or third game of second game of Klopp's first full season they got beat two 0 yeah, But since then, enough. yeah, since then they've won every single game. And Burnley tend to not be very good at home against the good teams. I mean, okay, they got a point against United, but as I say, they tend to not be very good against the good teams. <laughs> so I think um, I think Liverpool will win. We know what it's going to be like. I'm going to go with three one Liverpool. Ghosty, how do you reckon it might play out? I think the interesting point is this about Weagles that they've just signed. I mean, I think he seems to be a lot. I mean, I've only, only seen glimpses of him. I've seen him the other night, but he seems to be a bit of an upgrade on Chris Wood, like for like in terms of big target man. But 
<clears throat> I still think Liverpool will have enough to, to shut Burnley out and they don't tend to have too many problems despite this narrative that exists from a game in August 2016. I think Liverpool will win 3-0. Yeah, Wakehorst, a big Liverpool fan, I am told by uh, someone in Germany. So apparently that could be uh, an interesting storyline as well. Tom, who are you, uh, or rather, what are you going to go for for the scoreline? Uh, Paul's just gone with my uh, prediction. I was going to go for 3-0. Um, I don't think Burnley will score. Um, yeah, I think it would be comfortable enough for Liverpool. So say 3-0. Good stuff. Well, plenty of build-up and reaction to come in all of the usual places. But from myself, Matt Addison, from Ian Doyle, Paul Ghost and Tom Cavilla, it's goodbye for now.